Hi, everyone. My name is Anita Varma, and I lead the Solidarity Journalism Initiative at the Center for Media Engagement here at UT Austin. And I'm so excited that all of you are here today and really extra excited to be collaborating with my favorite collaborator, Aubrey Nagel, who is the Director of Practice Change at Resolve Philly, which is based in Philadelphia. And today we're gonna to be discussing this important and timely topic of putting voters first, solidarity reporting for democracy. So some of you may have attended solidarity reporting workshops before. For others, this might be the first time. Uh, we welcome any and all, and please tell your networks. We have more events to come, all of which are virtual. Uh, so just a couple of notes before we dive in. Number one, we really encourage discussion and we'll have time for Q&A uh, and you also have access to the chat. We do ask that we keep our comments respectful, uh, keeping in mind that we all come from different places, different experiences, and we want to hold space for all of those. Uh, the second thing, as I mentioned, for anyone who arrived a minute later, we are recording this and we'll make it available more widely uh, after this event. So if there's anything that you wanted to discuss not in a recording, please feel free to reach out to me or Aubrey afterwards and we'd be happy to chat more privately. So with that, uh, we will dive in. So I will share a few thoughts to frame our discussion of what solidarity could possibly have to do with reporting for democracy. And then I will turn things over to Aubrey, who will give us some really specific tips and useful insights into thinking about frames, word choice, and priorities as you all are heading into a very busy election coverage a uh, few days, weeks, seasons. So with that, I will start to share. All right, hopefully you all are seeing my screen. Excellent. So as you all are probably aware, solidarity comes up in places that do not have democracies. And so to prepare for today, I was thinking about some things that democracy and solidarity share in common. So here are a few thoughts to get our minds going in this direction. So first and foremost, in a democracy and in solidarity, Legitimacy does not come from divine right or from family lineage. It actually comes from the people. People are the ones with power, with or without a official title. And the third piece that really democracy and solidarity share in common is this idea of standing together that when we stand together, we can be stronger together. And instead of all operating as individuals who act in these parallel streams, it's very common both in democratic contexts and in solidarity contexts, as well as the overlap to see people working together to advance demands for a better society. So what does that mean for journalism? Well, I'm very glad you asked. As you can see in the corner, there's a link to a longer solidarity reporting guide that some of you might find interesting. Uh, but I always try to start by explaining what it is that I mean by solidarity. So solidarity is a commitment to social justice that translates into action. A commitment to social justice that translates into action. So social justice is a word that we hear thrown around in a lot of different ways. And it's something that I think is useful to pin down definitionally as very simply dignity for everyone in a society. Dignity for everyone in a society. This means that no one is left out. So we know that people have intrinsic dignity, right? We don't earn our dignity. We don't qualify for it. We don't get awarded dignity. We all have it by virtue of being human beings. And yet what we also know is that many institutional arrangements do not already respect that basic humanity. So solidarity really tries to, to, to take issue in situations where people's basic dignity is not being respected. Now, that last word of this definition is also really important. It translates into action. 
So a lot of times people will say, I feel solidarity. I think in solidarity. I promise to do better in solidarity. And all of those things are on, on the right track. But until we see action out in the world, we haven't yet reached this standard of solidarity. So what's useful about solidarity reporting is that it offers us a way to resist elected officials or candidates who may try to leverage news routines to amplify misinformation, right? And I'll say a little bit more about that in just a minute. But solidarity reporting is really specifically concerned with issues that disrespect or deny people's basic humanity. So solidarity reporting is committed to people's basic dignity and the action that that translates into is reporting on issues where their dignity is being disrespected. So a question I often get when I talk about solidarity reporting is, well, isn't that just standard reporting? Aren't reporters always trying to go out and, and address cases where people's basic dignity is at stake? I wish that were the case. It would be great if this were the standard for all reporting, we would not have much need to have a workshop about it. But what we see much more often is that officials, particularly officials with platforms and podiums from which to speak, will be very glad to amplify both information and misinformation from those podiums. And what happens next? Well, very likely it hits your news feed. It, appears in your news apps. It might circumvent news altogether and come in through social media and even closed networks that officials are saying X, Y, and Z. Does that mean X, Y, and Z are necessarily true? Absolutely not. But standard reporting often leads to reporters amplifying whatever they might hear from an official. The newsworthiness is in the fact that an official said it, rather than in the truth or veracity of the statement. Solidarity reporting is not looking at folks who are perched high atop a podium, right? We're looking from the grassroots up, oftentimes from the bottom of society up, to really take concern and focus to dignity at the level of people's basic needs. So what are some of these very basic needs? Well, that might include access to clean water, clean air, sufficient food, safe shelter. And speaking of safety, public safety is increasingly a concern uh, across many different parts of this country and are absolutely in many various ways on the ballot come November. So I want us to consider that if any of us are going without these very basic needs right at the bottom of this pyramid, then we are in some way being treated as less than human. And solidarity reporting would say that right there, that's newsworthy. We need to pay attention to that, to understand why it's happening and how it can change. Now, you might be thinking, well, most voters aren't affected by issues where they lack clean water. Most voters are not affected by situations where they lack shelter, right? In terms of numbers, they're certainly, and thankfully, not a majority of people that lack having their basic needs met. So why would a news audience care if these issues don't directly affect them or if they only affect a small subset? Well, in solidarity reporting, the newsworthiness standard is actually not that an issue affects the majority of people, right? So instead, the standard becomes if people are living in conditions that deny their basic dignity, even a few, comparatively few, this might be a small minority, yet we all still need to take notice and take action, right? That this aspect of people not having their dignity respected means that there's something where, as a larger civic community, we all need to take notice and not be okay with it. So just because reporters do this type of reporting, uh, we wanna be clear that reporters are not in the business of mind control, right? We heard this quite a lot after the 2016 election, reporters noting that if they had been able to control what people thought and what people thought about, 
uh, we would have seen many different outcomes. And so certainly we don't want to suggest that news reporting of any kind is somehow puppeteering or a puppet master that will somehow guide people to the polls one way or another. Even the priorities that news outlets might set may not map on always to what voters end up caring the most about. But although journalism is not deciding everything in terms of what voters care about, journalism does play a role in making issues more salient or less salient to people who aren't directly affected by them. So we all might be familiar uh, with the Flint water crisis, right? I would expect that few or none of us in this Zoom room live in Flint, and yet we're still aware of it. Why? In large part because of news media coverage that made that an issue, not only for people living in Flint, but for people who are outside of Flint and need to be concerned if a group of people lack water, excuse me, lack clean water. So let's say I've convinced you and you're interested in doing some reporting in solidarity with voters, what would you do next? Well, I'm very glad you asked. So to start with, I would suggest starting by investigating people's basic needs. That includes housing stability, housing affordability, clean water, public safety. And let's be clear that public safety is not the same thing as crime, right? There are many communities that are endangered regularly, and yet it's not considered a crime or treated as a crime that these communities live in fear. But looking at people's experiences of public safety and what they need and what, what could be missing from, from these levels of basic needs. The second, as you're investigating basic needs, is to consider the limitations of polls and surveys. We saw this quite a bit in 2016, where some journalists were not necessarily prepared to consider that all of these polls have their own limitations, right? The representativeness, that response rates from different groups uh, may require taking some of these predictions with a grain of salt. So my biggest suggestion is to try to triangulate, right? Try to grab from multiple data sources and to consider the limitations of each one rather than treating one data source as the answer, capital T, capital A. Why is that so important? Well, from one data source, we might have indication that people's basic needs are being met. Nothing to see here, no solidarity reporting to be done. But as soon as we look at a different data source or multiple other data sources, that story might begin to change. And finally, this is a question that I hear quite a lot from journalists who are concerned about what it might mean to take sides. And I know that Aubrey will have much more to say about this, so please take this by way of transition that I would suggest if you notice a difference between how potential voters are talking about an issue in, let's say, a region or city that you're covering, and it doesn't map on to how candidates are talking about that same issue, rather than necessarily needing to decide the candidate is right or the voters are right, I think that is a story in itself. So in solidarity with voters, that means that voters would see themselves in your coverage that seeks to represent their concerns, as well as what they'll be uh, voting on when we approach November. So with that, let me turn it over to Aubrey. All right, thank you so much, Nita. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, it's great to um, see you all virtually and um, really excited to talk more and answer questions in a little bit. Um, just as a refresher and also to those who joined us a little later, um, uh, I'm Aubrey Nagel. I am the Director of Practice Change at Resolve Philly. Um, I lead Modifier, which is our um, the practice change and professional development arm of Resolve Philly. So I get to the lovely job of um, uh, working in spaces like this and getting to talk to other journalists about uh, ways we can all improve our work, um, which is awesome. And so, yeah, with that um, transition, um, I can't wait to share with you all some tips for putting um, everything that Nita was just talking about into practice through word choice and framing articles that we're writing about upcoming elections, midterms, and, uh, you know, every, all the subjects surrounding that as well. Um, so I'm going to share my screen real quick. 
always takes me a second. All right, y'all can see my screen? All right, thank you. Um, all right, so yeah, let's talk a little bit about the language of democracy. When we're standing in solidarity um, with voters, with the people who are impacted um, by democratic choices, there are a lot of different ways that we can and do make um, choices in our journalism that affect um, how voters interpret the issues and how they will make their choices going forward um, while voting. And there are a lot of there are a lot of ways that through our um, kind of traditional ways of looking at journalism and you know focusing on just the facts or objectivity that actually um, somewhat undermine the um, choices of voters themselves by privileging certain narratives um, around politics over others. So that's really what where I want to focus um, today. So first, oh, I forgot I added this. These animations were added by themselves. I'm so sorry. I hate animations in, <laughs> um, in slides. Uh, but one thing I really, the way I want to start this conversation is really by kind of setting or start the language conversations really by setting the table on what that looks like um, for journalists who are struggling with the idea of partisanship in relation to reporting on elections and reporting on democracy. Um, I, obviously, um, for, for those of us who are looking to share information that helps audiences make political choices, that I think we can all agree is a democratic value, right? We're, we're trying to provide people with the information that they need to make choices themselves so that they can contribute to civic society, and um, hopefully make um, hope hopefully make their choices for the community that um, solve their issues, solve their problems collectively. Um, and you know, ergo, if we are you know adding these things together, if that is your goal as a journalist, then you are kind of de facto pro democracy, right? And that is something that we should feel comfortable saying that as journalists, if we are considering ourselves journalists that we must be pro-democracy, Dem uh, journalism and free freedom of the press is a pillar of democracy. These things are in, inextricably linked. I mean, we need to get comfortable um, taking that stance as an industry. Um, so I, I want to frame a lot of this conversation in this graphic, actually, and a lot of the language choices in this graphic. This is, you might have seen lots of versions of this on social media. It's from um, a group called Gaping Void Culture cultural science consulting. Um, and there's lots of different versions of this, but I think it really maps very well to the goals of journalism um, in a way that helps us understand our position within democracy. Um, we are, as an industry, people who discover data and find it, we might be able to surface it um, from places that most people don't get to see it or would never have the chance to find it by virtue of it being our jobs. We have the time, we have the resources in order to dig up data. Um, and data you know, might mean the numerical kind of um, spreadsheet data that comes to mind when you think of data, but is also just other facts and events um, that, and you know, anecdotes that come to us from all sorts of places. Um, and it's up to us to also find patterns in that data that creates that information. I mean, tons of different industries do this, but journalism certainly is one of those where we take raw data essentially and find the patterns within it and amplify those patterns in order to help other people find meaning in that data. Um, so when we do that, we are essentially creating otherwise unknown information. And then we are presenting that in a way that creates knowledge for the people who are taking it in. We're, we're connecting the dots, literally. We're finding the dots, filling them in with these colors and connecting them so that other people who don't have the time and resources to dig into all this data are able to draw something conclusive from it. Um, we're also able by virtue of our position and our vantage point, um, again, having, having it be our jobs to look at information and pull apart these patterns, uh, we're able to uh, share insights that, that maybe not only us, but certainly, uh, fewer people than the majority are able to do because we are taking in all of this information. We can, you know, connect different seemingly disparate dots and explain the complex connections between them um, and create that insight and wisdom that we can gain from this. And that is the impact that we hope to have on readers and audiences and listeners, right? So all of these things, this is how we break down our information. And if we are to be pro-democracy, then we, you know, we need to be um, understanding that we are doing, we are supporting democracy through each stage of this work, right? Um, and thus, 
being pro-democracy requires us being able to comfortably acknowledge anti-democracy. We need to be able to call it what it is. We need to be able to point it out and connect the dots for our audiences. And we need to be able to be um, unafraid to say so, um, even if it might result in attacks from one party or another, um, that we are you know, biased towards a different party for calling out acts of you know, anti-democracy anti actions. Um, so it, is it our duty actually to tell our audiences plainly, plainly and clearly it, it, that is um, really the heart of all of this information. And so the some of the slides I'm about to go through um, are very word heavy um, and have lots of information definitions on them. And that is because they are also like the basis for um, an updated elections language guide that we'll be publishing uh, next week. Um, and also that we'll be sharing these slides. So I might not go over every single bit of these slides, but there'll be a resource that's available um, to you all. So just want to say that before blitzing through some, uh, <laughs> some language. Um, but I want to start with some uh, really basic terms that are part of this conversation, right? So what are we talking about when we say, when we even say anti-democracy? What does anti, what do anti-democratic actions look like? Um, so anti-democratic, this is definitely, you know, technically the right adjectival form for any actions or events that oppose democracy, that get in the way of democracy. Um, but it does bring to mind really the democratic process more so than it does bring to mind democracy as an institution, as a form of government, as our chosen form of government. Um, and it also, depending on the framing, can read as kind of big D Democrat as in the party. So I wanna, when you're using this uh, phrase to describe acts of you know, anti-democracy, that actually might be the term that is uh, favorable to you and is more to the point. So I wanna keep that in mind as we're, as we're um, talking about this. Um, and uh, that has a lot to do with election denialism. So these things really go hand in hand. Um, and I'm bringing up these two terms because these are really the pillars of a challenge that we're facing as a country in polarization and misinformation. Um, as we're heading into election, these are really things that in order to stand um, in support of democracy, journalists need to be aware of and focusing on in their reporting. Um, election denialism, to me, much like um, the term climate denialism or climate deniers, this really is a misnomer that we're using a lot in our industry right now to describe people who are who likely um, know the truth about the, the structure of our electoral system um, and finding so far with investigations and um, all of the uh, evidence so far built up through those investigations that have not supported really any blanket distrust or questioning of our electoral and democratic system. Um, there are, these are folks who have access to that information um, folks who are in um, in races themselves, candidates who are preemptively saying they might not accept election results, who might who are setting the stage, setting the groundwork already in their on the campaign trail on the cam campaign trail um, that they might not accept uh, a result in which they lose. Right. So the word deny really implies that this process is in question, is up for debate, is up for. Um, it buys into the premise that this is, you know, a, a debate over legitimacy when it is not. Um, so we really need to get rid of this framing of denialism, um, especially when uh, we can, in um, many instances, we might not be able to particularly figure out the intent of somebody saying that they are not going to accept the election results if they truly believe and not, and also what this person might never ever say that. And if we were waiting for that intent to be clear, we'd be waiting a very long time. Um, we, but we don't have to describe the intent of a person who is describing climate or election denialism in order to describe the impact of that opposition, right? So um, a suggestion I have for however you're describing um, election deniers, if they are in your local races or national races, is really to flip um, from denial to opposition language. And so that might look like focusing on people opposing election results, people who uh, a candidate who has said that they are in, intend to oppose valid election results. Um, they are not just, you know, sowing doubt or casting doubt. They are attempting to convince others to oppose valid election, election results. I mean, that really kind of stomps down the premise that this is something up for debate. If other evidence arises that should put our electoral system in question and that there is mass fraud or mass problems with it, that, you know, this language should change. 
but there have been many investigations and very little evidence of any fraud, let alone mass fraud, um, that a lot of election deniers are talking about. So that's really important to keep in mind. Um, a, another thing, and these are you know not definitions I'm going to get into a lot of details on right now, but another um, topic I wanted to touch on is in this, in this uh, metaphor of creating insight by linking knowledge together. Um, when we're talking about anti-democracy, and if we're talking about anti-democracy as the institution, the chosen form of government in the U.S., if we're talking about the U.S. midterm elections coming up, um, something we have to talk about are alternatives to democracy. What are what are the types of government that folks who are uh, looking to overturn democratic elections are looking for instead? Um, and the term terms like fascism, populism, authoritarianism, these get thrown around quite a bit. Um, and often are in our industry derided as um, as either oversimplistic or um, uh, what's what's the term I'm looking for um, exaggerated um, or hyperbolic in describing um, what politicians are doing. But if you you know if you look carefully at the and these are definitions from Merriam-Webster and Encyclopedia Britannica, really just like the literal definitions of these terms. Um, when when we are describing actions by politicians and candidates themselves who are looking to overturn. Um, valid election results, their actions might fall into uh, or might be accurately described as fascist or authoritarianistic or authoritarian. There, are, these things might be applicable, and it is important that we describe them as such and do the math for our audiences um, by linking these insights together by understanding how the historic um, implications of fascism and authoritarianism and the decline of democracy across the world for the past a couple of decades and put that context into place for our audiences. So these are important definitions to know and understand um, and that we um, need to be more specific when we're talking about extremist politics and avoid those kind of vague terms um, like far right or far left or extreme um, in relation to parties because those don't offer a lot of historic context. They just kind of offer hyper partisanship in many ways. Um, another couple of uh, framing devices that I wanted to chat about in relation to politics and elections. Um, uh, some of the pit pitfalls of traditional objectivity in journalism are really this uh, fear of looking biased, right? This fear of appearing to buy it to uh, favor one party over another. Um, and when we are in a situation like we are currently in which um, one party and its leaders are actively sowing distrust in media, regardless of the truth, um, in order to uh, establish among its base a distrust and dismissal of any fact-based journalism, we must be able to um, not capitulate to um, audiences that will, you know, that won't trust us ever in order to appear non-biased. Um, because uh, all of that does is water down the actions of all everyone involved in the political system, right? We need to be able to call out what is happening as it's happening. I um, mean, if we're not able to do that uh, across all parties, then we're not able to do it at all. Um, and a couple of ways that this happens in um, in the news industry are through both sidesism and it's you know, kind of, kind of subgenre of false equivalence, or essentially we're taking information from either party, so maybe two candidates that are in a similar race, and um, making them seem more equal than they are just because they come from either party, regardless of their proportionality, of their truthfulness, um, and that, you know, doesn't do justice for anybody. For instance, there's a headline here from NBC News um, that describes uh, events that happened in the um, Pennsylvania race uh, that John Fetterman is in versus the uh, Georgia race that Herschel Walker is in. Uh, Fetterman suffered a stroke uh, earlier this year and has been recovering um, and has sought accommodations in a few interviews, which caused for, you know, really no valid reason controversy that he was seeking accommodations while he recovers from the stroke. Um, and at the same time, Herschel Walker has been um, accused of um, uh, of sending hush, mo hush money essentially to former partners in order to abet their abortions. And he's been on the campaign, cam campaign trail. I'm having trouble with that phrase today. Um, and has been speaking out ag against abortion. So that, you know, these are not equal things, right? But this headline here <laughs> puts them on the same plane for some reason. There's actually no reason to compare either of these events besides the fact that they're from two different parties, right? Um, we need to avoid that. 
Um, another thing that I'm, I, if somebody has a good, a better name for this or an existing name for this, I would love to hear it, but I keep referring to it as journalistic ventriloquism, which is throwing attribution, uh, accurate descriptions of something, um, especially something that one political party may object to, um, to some vague other, right? So the journalist isn't the one saying it. We're not the one drawing the conclusion. You can't, you can't pin it on us, the newspaper, for saying this but somebody said it and we're gonna to refer to it that way to cover our butts essentially. Um, this is a way of, uh, of doing that. Um, there's a, um, a headline or a subhead here from the New York Times in which Kanye West made some very clearly anti-Semitic tweets a few, I think last week. Um, and they had initially written it as like widely criticized and anti-Semitic. It just was anti-Semitic. They didn't eventually change this, but that's a great example of you don't need to throw that attribution to somewhere else. We can say that. We can do the math for our audiences, right? Put two and two together and tell them how it is. That's our jobs. Um, I won't go over this too much, um, but there are some links um, of research that I wanted to share with you all. And this is kind of just my reminder to do that. Um, and I will put them in the chat in a second. Um, where, you know, the horse race coverage, um, coverage of polls, as Anita had mentioned, um, has a lot of um, negative impacts on voters, and there's lots of research to back this up. I would definitely encourage you to dig into it. If you are a newsroom that has something like the New York Times needle, oh my God, please, for the love of God, get rid of it. <laughs> it is so bad for democracy. Um, you can read more about that. I want to focus on the language of uh, switching, though, from this horse race coverage um, and who's winning, who's losing, to how to uh, show that impact on voters. So that horse race coverage I mentioned is really, you know, describing all elections as a game between politicians to be won or lost, um, who's in the lead, who's scoring the most points, describing it like a sport, essentially. Um, again, really not good for voters, really not good for democracy. What is an alternative? Focusing on voter impact, standing with voters in solidarity, and reframing all of the, all of these, you know, what we call wins and losses um, as describing them as how they affect social movements and the people impacted by political decision making. So rather than focusing on um, the, you know, who is winning or calling something a win for a, a party or a leader who got something passed, we want to describe that in terms of the impact on voters themselves. And it seems like just a, you know, a semantic switch, but it really is very important for audiences to be able to understand that they are what, that this isn't just some you know, hobby to follow, which is how a lot of people feel about politics. They're like, I'm not into politics, as if it is sports that you can just like be engaged in by choice for fun and that might affect you or it might not. Um, this this really helps um, everyone understand their stakes in elections, get more involved, get more engaged. Um, so avoiding war language, anything that pits us versus them um, and, uh, and amplifying, you know, dangerous rhetoric from either party that dehumanizes the other side. We want to avoid that. Um, and, uh, and some simple ways to reframe this language is really instead of if you're you know about to write a headline that says X election is a win for the larger Democratic Party or the larger Republican Party, simply reframing it as that it is a win, you, you know, if you still want to use the win loss framing, who is it a win for? Is it a win for voters who support X policies? That's, who, that's what they were voting for. They were voting for these policies and those people won. That is relevant, right? The voters who are supporting these policies won. People want to know that information. Um, or instead of describing a, you know, a new, uh, something that was passed or, or um, you know, a blue wave or a red wave being a loss for X advocates, talking about that this is a loss for those impacted by X policies that this party will be passing or is planning or ran on a campaign of. Um, and most importantly, when we're talking about, this was definitely a big factor in the 2020 election when there was lots of changes to electoral, um, uh, the electoral process because of the pandemic. Um, there were lots of fears over how that would impact um, the election results themselves. And you might see, it might've seen language framed as like, um, this is, a, a, the Democrats are worried about the Postal Service messing with election results. We all should be worried about the lack of resources of the Postal Service affecting election results. That's a threat to democracy, not just to Democrats, right? We need to think big picture. What is this actually affecting beyond, um, you know, the head of that party? So reframing those in a simple, it, it is really simple. Um, this is a headline example that, you know, does that I think really well, just by explaining that 
the upcoming election is not just voters choosing between candidates, it's them seeing a choice between um, anti-abortion or pro-abortion policies. Really simple way of doing that. Um, speaking of uh, you know, changes to the election process, we might not see this as, um, as frequently in the midterm elections, but certainly with certain races that are really close, we might, there's very good chance that we'll see um, slower election results come in um, that rather than um, our usual expected results that day or night or next morning, things might take time. There might be recounts. There might be, you know, um, uh, um, the there might be um, absentee and mail-in ballots that arrive late, depending on the state. There's lots of different things in play um, for this upcoming election. Um, so that's why we want to normalize slow election results. We don't do that well as an industry. We really like to be the first and we like to get everyone answers as soon as possible. And sometimes it's just not possible. And that might be the case this year for certain races. So we want to really avoid any words that make slower than normal results seem bad, seem like a mistake, because it's not a mistake. It's just the way that it is. If we're if we have lots of mail-in ballots to count, it's just going to take longer. It's not because it's wrong or incorrect or that somebody messed with it. It's just that it takes longer to count mail ballots, right? Or whatever it might be. So we need to really make sure that we're not using words like delays, which really implies you know some sort of interference with it or confusion that we're confused about the results. We're not confused about the results. We just haven't gotten them yet, right? That's what we're talking about. If we're talking about long longer counts, um, of course that that implies that. What I'm speaking of is is longer counts that you know don't have any you know problems with machines going down or something. Um, we're talking about just like the normal process of events, but we want to make sure that that's really clear to to folks um, and to avoid things like um, this candidate is is ahead in the race, but we haven't counted this many absentee ballots yet. Right? They're not ahead because it's not a literal race. Right? It doesn't. Whoever's votes are counted first doesn't matter. It matters at the end what the results are. So we want to stay away from that kind of language. Um, and try to focus on, you know, if if you want to use election a week instead of election day, that's helpful. That helps set the tone for folks, election season. Um, explaining that we are on track for a longer counting process, that like things are going as normal, but it's going to take longer. We should expect a slower pace. Those are all great um, phrases to include in your explanations. I mean, just be really clear about what can and cannot be inferred from incomplete counts. If you, you know you have certain precincts um, reporting, that might mean that your results are are clear in one place, and it might mean that they're very unclear in another. Be very um, transparent and feature as much context as possible when explaining what incomplete counts do and do not mean. What we can infer from them, right? So. All of this is just to, you know, help lower the temperature of this, you know, the setup that we're already seeing to to con contest uh, election results and the process itself. We want to lower the temperature there as much as possible. Um, and very quickly, a way that you should definitely be including all of the things that we've just talked about is in your headlines. Um, they, as you can see from this slide, they work for a reason. You will read a headline first. It'll set the tone for the rest of what you're looking at. It'll set the tone for the audience. It also might be, and I say this constantly, um, if you are an, an audience member, there are so many more headlines in the world than articles that you can read in a day. It's not that people just read headlines. It's that they can't read every article. They're going to see a lot more headlines than they are art read articles, right? So they're very important. Um, my personal soapbox, questions as headlines should be banned, and I hate them. They're self-serving, they're for SEO purposes, they make people click, it's just for us journalists, it's not for the audience. Get rid of them, fight your SEO editors as much as you can. I understand that they are helpful in getting people to read your article, but all it does is create speculation or uncertainty where there is none. Get rid of them. Um, and don't let false claims from politicians or candidates stand alone in, in headlines. Just because it sounds outrageous does not mean that it should get to stand alone in a headline. That, that is implied irony on behalf of journalists. We're saying like, look how wild this is that they said. What we actually should be saying is this is untrue. This is what they said. We need the true sandwich that this is false. This is what they said. This is actually the reality, right? That it works for a reason. Um, an example of that is starting out this sentence. This is from last year of without evidence. Senator Heller says that this will lead to fraud. Starting with that of like, this is not true. This is what he said. That's a great format. Um, 
so with that, I will, uh, I know we want to have lots of time for, for chat and questions. Um, again, this information will all be in our election um, guide. You can find that at modifier at um, modifier.resolvephilly.org. And that's my email address. And I'll put those both in the chat too. And that's our beautiful new modifier logo that I can't stop showing everybody. Amazing. Thank you so much, Aubrey. I have just dropped in the chat uh, links to my slides and my contact information. And as Aubrey said, she'll drop some more links in the chat so you all have these materials and can also reach us um, after this. But now is my favorite portion of Solidarity Reporting Workshops, which is time for your questions. Uh, anyone who would like to, you can drop it in the chat, you can unmute. Um, any questions or reactions that are coming up for you? I do this with my students. Yep. I will I know, give I us a that. chance for some silence <laughs> while we think. <laughs> Oh, here we go. Question from Naomi. What do you think is going to be the biggest challenge with this upcoming midterm season? Aubrey, do you want to take that first? Yeah, I mean, I think if I if I wasn't hitting this over the head enough, I think that the um, uh, having lots of candidates uh, refute election results is going to be one of the biggest challenges. I think uh, there's a lot of candidates setting the stage for um, a battle over results that they don't like um, and saying in interviews that they they won't say whether they will accept the results or I'll I'll accept results that say that I win or you know any anything that would um, oppose their winning is invalid essentially or Ill illegitimate and that is obviously a huge uh, blow to democracy that that's where we are um, but it is a reality and something that we have to cover very carefully in order to um, ensure that audiences are aware of what is true and what is false um, without, without, yeah, kind of making that capitulation to um, folks who, to, or, or accepting the premise that, um, that those candidates are right to question dis the electoral process despite evidence and investigations showing like very little fraud and such. Um, so I think balancing, balancing, uh, balancing, covering those statements with covering the truth, um, and, and essentially, uh, balancing what is newsworthy public figures disseminating misinformation with, um, uh, without having that repeat effect actually get into folks' brains, I think is the biggest challenge ahead, of, ahead for us. Yeah. How much do Thank you for that, Aubrey. I, I agree 100%. And I think what that amounts to is the way that I would frame this challenge, which is disillusionment. Mm -hmm. So in 2020, a lot of the narrative after election day was even without official results across the board, uh, turnout was mm -hmm. beyond any expectations between mail-in ballots and people who went in person. Uh, and I think that in most midterm elections, there's a very different narrative about people just not necessarily engaging, but certainly now uh, coming out of a difficult two years in many people's cases, this feeling that, you know, politics doesn't really matter. Politics can't really affect my life. Win or lose, it doesn't make a difference. And I think that's where journalism has a great capacity to encourage people to to care and to see how they might be able to affect change, uh, especially by standing together. We have a question from Trent. How would you cover quotes from politicians that contain false information without giving them the platform to push the misinformation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a tricky one. Um, and I, I think it amounts to two different things. So right, the um, the Presenting misinformation, and it, there are ways that we know you can present misinformation and fact checks in a way that is more effective than other ways, right? So that truth sandwich that we talk about, um, we always want to ensure as a rule that we are repeating the truth more often than we are repeating the falsehood that is being pushed. So just from a, uh, you know, from a 
the side of writing the article itself, writing the headline, you know, choosing what information, what how many articles to write about something, choosing what to put first. We need to understand that whatever the outcome is of what we're producing, the truth needs to be said more times. That's just the, and if it sounds repetitive, I know we hate, like, there's a reason that we don't do this as journalists because it sounds repetitive to us and we don't like that and it's bad writing. Well, guess what? Sometimes providing correct information is not great writing. <laughs> it doesn't, that should not be our priority being, you know, wordsmiths that we are. That is sometimes, you know, how we, we make decisions about what we put in a sentence or in a headline. Um, but that's not necessarily the same thing as uh, getting uh, accurate information into people's brains. So uh, making sure that proportion of truth to false is right. Double double the truth than the false um, is an important thing to. So that means, you know, in a headline as that, with that last example, starting with a phrase or a clause that makes clear that what the next thing that comes out of that headline is false is really, really important. That has to be in the headline. Um, and also, we need to be really clear with audiences about um, that this is misinformation. We should not be afraid of using the word misinformation when somebody, especially a political figure or public figure who is supposed to be working for the people and helping spread correct information, if their job, it, that is their job as a, you know, uh, somebody representing um, their constituents, um, if they are presenting repeatedly misinformation, that it should be called such, you know, in the headline, um, Governor X, Y, and Z continues to push misinformation about X. There's a difference between disinformation. Disinformation is the um, uh, purposeful, you know, ma manipulation of messages to uh, to give people not the truth. I'm stumbling with my words there, but essentially, like the it's the intention. It's the difference between manslaughter and murder. Essentially, um, disinformation is purposeful. Misinformation is some, it might be, it's like a, also a rectangle square situation, um, might be pur purposeful, but might not be, right? So it is perfectly accurate if, if a politician is repeatedly giving out incorrect information to call that misinformation. We can do that as an industry. Um, and also a pet peeve of mine is, is a, as much as that was great in that um, last example of like without evidence, somebody says X, Y, and Z. If there is evidence against what they are saying, we should be using the words against evidence that it is against the study against the investigation of X, Y, and Z against research um, because they are opposing, they have access to this information. We should not pretend otherwise, right? They are politicians, they are candidates, they are seeking to represent people. Um, they have access to the correct information. If they are choosing not to do so, then they are being willfully ignorant and we are able to call it what it is that it is against evidence, not just without evidence as, it, as if nobody has it, right? If we do have it, we gotta say it. Sorry, most of my, that's my soapbox, that one. I think that's a fantastic soapbox. I really appreciate this question, Trent. And I just dropped in the chat. I hope the sharing settings work. Give it a click and let me know if it doesn't. But this is a piece that I found quite by accident this summer from 1985. It's called When the Government Tells Lies. And it's written by a journalist. Some of you may have heard of Anthony Morrow. And uh, the section that you'll see some highlighting around is called Go to the People Affected. And I think that's crucial, right? That's the solidarity reporting approach to say, what is actually happening? So one of the examples in this article that you'll see is when in the Reagan administration, they cut disability and claimed that no one who was truly disabled was affected. And then what did journalists do? They went to people whose, whose disability support was cut. And these were folks who were severely disabled. And so the truth comes out, not through the journalists necessarily needing to somehow know or be able to uh, amass a, a scientific level of evidence, but simply by talking to people affected, right? Or talking to people who are the subjects of these claims. If someone says, gas prices are lower than they've ever been, let's go look at what is happening at gas stations and where. If people are claiming gas prices are higher than they've ever been, let's look at that too. Where and who is reporting this? Uh, and based on what are they making these claims? And a lot of claims about what, especially middle-class American families, we hear that group invoked quite a lot, 
politicians and political candidates may be very keen to make claims about those groups. Let's actually hear from some American middle class families. What are they experiencing? What are they not experiencing? What are their needs and concerns? So that politicians are not the only ones with a platform, right? And that's where solidarity reporting as an intervention can make sure that journalism is not being leveraged or kind of played against itself to just become a megaphone for politicians' claims. Thank you for those questions, both Trent and Naomi, for being our, our brave first question askers. Do we have, we have time for one more, if folks have one more question. If not, I'll ask Aubrey a question, but let me hold space for all of you. <laughs> All right, then this is my chance. Aubrey, I adore so many of your specific tips, all of your specific tips and guidance. How would I convince my editor? As a reporter, I would love to do all of these things, but let me tell you, if I do them, I will get line edited and perhaps spoken to sternly for doing a lot of them. What advice do you have for folks to convince their editors? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is really, you know, the, the million dollar question for a lot of reporters who, you know, we hear that a lot, like, oh, I love this, but my editor won't go for it, right? Um, and the the answer for me, a lot of, it depends on your editor, I will say. So some people, uh, just in general, really respond to, well, research says so, such and such about, you know, this effect, um, and others, uh, you know, might respond better to a emotional appeal from their reporter of like this, this is why I feel this way about um, such and such. So, you know, with those two things in mind, um, there is research to back up a lot of the, as I mentioned, I threw a couple of those links into um, the chat here, um, how that back up how the coverage of elections reporting as we have done traditionally as an industry um, negatively impact uh, voters in disin essentially disenfranchising them, convincing them to stay home from um, the polls, not go, you know, it disengage from civic life in general. Um, and the ways to do that are, um, and that it, that it is a direct result of the framing of politics and elections as a game for elites that is separate from them, right? It is a direct result of that. Um, and so, you know, there, if your if your editor is somebody who does respond to like research like that, there is uh, a lot out there, including what I shared, um, and a couple of great articles from uh, that I don't have the links to right this second, but from journalist resource that summarize those in a really quick and easy way, which is great. Um, it might be a quick read for an editor that just explains the impact because a lot of um, a lot of what we do in journalism or have done traditionally is based in uh, notions of object objectivity and traditional professionalism um, and not on impact of audiences. It's based off of, you know, what we've taught in our um, J schools and what editors of your have decided not actually, you know, focus on the impact on people. Um, and so that I think is the best argument. Um, if your editor is a grammarian, getting down into the weeds of those semantics I think it can make a really compelling argument if you're like, well, this this word actually means this, like denial means something different than opposition. Um, talking about that intent versus impact, um, like getting really into the weeds over a word choice, I welcome that argument and like maybe take it one at a time, right? Like it's, if it's a concept, rather than focus on, you know, this per, like this phrase in this line of this story, talking to another about like, you know, going forward on this beat, I really want to be using this phrase more often than this one. And here's why and making a case for that and kind of going one step at a time, I think is the way um, because those those arguments do get really nuanced and take a little time. Yeah, I love that advice. Thank you so much, Aubrey. I will add just one thought to synthesize, which is let's report truthfully, right? Mm -hmm. I think an editor who does not care about reporting truthfully is probably quite problematic on a lot of levels, but most editors, if we can convince them to uh, make some of these adjustments, maybe not all of them at once, but even a few, uh, that this can move us towards more accurate reporting, which is mm -hmm. supposed to be what we're all here for. 
Uh, I just dropped in the chat my contact information and would love to stay in touch with all of you. Um, please feel free to send questions, comments, uh, requests for other types of resources you might be looking for. I know Aubrey with Modifier will have tons available to you. Uh, when that election guide comes out, I will be bookmarking it right away. But again, just want to thank all of you for being here. Thank you for all of your dedication to journalism. And please stay safe and stay in touch. Be well.